Good morning. We are in the middle of chapter six. We are on page Sadik Vov, the equivalent of page 191. And we're about just past one third down. I'll read a couple lines inside, then I'll give us context. Um, it says here, Va'azai, where basically the first word on the line is Mazal V'cholu, and then the next word is Va'azai. We said, and the question was, well, I'll read this inside first. Va'azai yochel gama chayte, and therefore even the sinner, who poishe Yisrael, and not just one who did a sin, but one who is a, a significant sinner, lekabel chayes legufam, they can receive sustenance and life for their body, Benafshram Bahamas and for their animal soul, Kemoish Ar Balechaya Mamish, just like all other animals, Kemoisha Kosta, like it says, Nimshal Kabhemis Nidbu, we became like animals, like beasts of the field. In other words, what's the way that we can have sustenance in life today, even if someone's a sinner, even if someone does sins, because we become like animals? What does this mean? So to go back and we explain that there are two different paths of receiving sustenance, life, created forces from God. One is what the Jewish people get through a godly soul, and one is what the rest of creation gets. And there are two primary differences. And we're talking now, first of all, how it was in the times of the temple, how it was in the good days. Good morning. All Jewish people, there are godly souls, get their sustenance from what's called pnimius hachayas, the essence, the inside of God's life, God's life force. Good morning. And we get it what's called believe in Musa without going through any um, medium, without any adapter. The animals and the rest of the creation, which includes all other creatives, uh, both human beings and animals that are not Jewish, they get their life force, what's called chayis, the external part of chayis. I'll explain what that means in a moment. And through a medium. What is that medium? Klippa. They get it through a concealment. So two things happen. A Jew in the time of the temple would get his life force, number one, directly from Pnimi Yisachayis. What's Pnimi Yisachayis? Pnimi Yis means the inside. Chetzoni means the outside. What's the difference, inside or outside? Um, if I create a child, or if I create a piece of artwork. If I create a, a child, that's coming from my essence. That's part of me. It's my essence shared in that child. If I create an artwork, I didn't give my essence into it, but I created it. If I built a chair, if I made some furniture, I baked a cake. You can put your soul into it, but that's not you. It's the cake that you made, and it's not part of you. A child is part of you. That's called Pnimi Sechayis versus Chetzeni Sechayis. Mm -hmm. Everything gets, and that's the difference between Vayipach, blowing, versus Dibur, speech. Vayipach means it's an actual part of me being a force that's actually there being blown into the life, into the into Adam. The speech is not actually part of me. I mean, it, it's coming from me, but it's not like I said, oh, it entered and created. The life force is created by breath. That's an actual part of, me, part of me that's going in there. Which, by the way, as a side note, there's a mimer that a lot of us are learning now from the Alter Rebbe um, about uh, Tekiah Schaefer, and he starts off explaining the power of the power of speech the, and the words. And that which connects them together, which is the letter Aleph, where there's certain certain bounds that bonds it connected together. But you have the, the the force that creates breath, that ear that um, that comes out. That's essence. That's primius. Okay. So the first difference between all other created beings and the Jewish soul and the Shama of a Yid, never the kiss, is if it's an actual primius, a part of God, versus God gave energy to something. The second difference is when it comes down to this world, how does it get here? In the times of the temple, a Jew's life force came direct through no filters. It came directly to the Jew. You got unfiltered godliness. The animals, the all other creation, all other creations in the world, got their life force from Chetzenies, but also through a filter. It came through the filter of Klippas Nega. That means it's no longer pure. Now, Nega, as we mentioned, is the translucent uh, shell. In general, there's two types of shells. There's translucent and the complete. There's three types of the complete. That means there's four shells totally. When I say shells, I mean concealments. There's klipas nega, which le makes everything a potential for good or bad. And then there's three klipas, three shells, klipas atameis, that are absolutely bad. They can't be used for good. For example, uh, coffee is klipas nega. It's now neutral. 
If I use it to enjoy it and have a class, that's perfectly being it holy. If I use it for self-indulgence, I'm making a, a pleasurable experience in the morning, drinking my coffee, come as a selfish act. It doesn't have a purpose unless I'm having it. So I have more energy to be a better parent or a better, you know, person, community person. Shalosh Klippus Atomeus can't be used for good. A person can't say, you know what? I need energy to go and learn. I'm going to have a good piece of pork. And I'll use it for good. You can't. You cannot use something which is Shalosh Klippus Atomeus for good. You say, but what second? I'm using it for such a good purpose. It doesn't matter. It is evil in its essence. It's bound. It can't be fixed. So when the nations of the world or everyone else gets their life force, it comes both from Chesonius and from and through the medium of Klippa. What type of Klippa? We'll see. The Jewish people in times of the temple, pure, premius, unfiltered. That's to know. Now, after the temple was destroyed, the Jewish people now, after the destruction, we get our life force also through Klippas Nega. Now, we're still getting premius. We're still getting premius achai, so it's not the same as everybody else. We're not the same as a, as a kitten. We're not the same as, a, you know, a, 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 another uh, creation. We're getting it from Pneumius Achayis. That means it's the actual life force, Vayipach, but it's going through a filter of Klippas Nega. Everything else in the world also has a Klippas Nega, but it's not originally Pneumius, meaning it's something different. The same person couldn't create a child and create artwork. It came from the same place. Where one person is giving artwork, one person is giving child. Both of those can go through a storm go through an experience. They both come out weathered or beaten, but one's still a child and one's still the artwork. In other words, the experience of, of going through Nega is what happens to the Hamshacha or the um, flow or the energy that's being given. But to start off, those coming from the same place, everything comes from God, everything comes from that place. The Jewish, the Nefesh of the Kis, the godly soul comes from Pneumius and the rest of the world comes from Chesenius. And in the time of exile, we all go through the filter of Nega. That's what we have to know until we get to here. Now, that being said, what was the reason we said that a person could block and do a sin? Not a person could. Unfortunately, a person will block their um, life force if a person does a certain sin, like a car sin, is because you're blocking the fresh breeze. By the time it goes through no it's no longer a fresh breath of air. It's now more like a, a particle or a wave or something else that won't be blocked. It comes down to times of exile, a person is not blocking the since the the energy, even though it came from the holiest place, is filtered through klipa. No longer can you block it by doing a sin. You do a sin, it it gets around. Meaning it's not the same powerful breeze that comes through that you could just put up a wall and block it, pull up a hand and block it. Now it's coming through through the filter and it comes through like almost like a sound. And therefore, I today, God forbid, if someone has a sin, uh, I mean it has, seems to have a benefit that. A person won't die because of it, but it won't block the, the life force, not the same pure energy that could easily be blocked. It's sort of not as blockable. And therefore, a person could sin today and, um, so to speak, continue to be healthy and well and go on. So let's read this line again now. Now, the red line a second time, we'll understand the connect the flow. The Azai, and then, or because the temple was destroyed, because we're talking now that the life force became like everything else filtered through Klippas Nega through the translucent concealment. It's not pure air anymore that's pretty blocked. Therefore, um, they, we get we're getting our life force like all the other impure animals of the world. We're like animals. Now goes one step for the Adrabe. And this is going to be a fascinating idea that's explained at length in the Mimer, we're going to talk about why could you prosper even stronger? Why could a person who does a sin seem to not only be alive, but sometimes the wicked people seem to have a really good, and that righteous guy seems to be sometimes not so feeling well, has medical challenges, has poverty, and the wicked people seem to prosper. A big, uh, it's not a guarantee. doesn't mean if you're wicked, you're going to be successful. But oftentimes we see that it doesn't have a magic system, meaning the, the, the program that was set up, that the righteous should have certain blessings. Not only do the wicked have the blessings, but they could do sometimes much greater and much better. This is all based on a very fascinating idea. I want to share it first, and then we'll talk about it. This, this is a concept explained many places in Hasidus. All the negative evil forces of the world were created by the same God who created the good forces. It's not like other religions that believe that there's a struggle. There's God, and there's a Satan, and there's clashing. No. There's a God, and he has employees. One employee is the Malach Gavriel, Malach Machal. One employee is a Sutton. And the Sutton was given a particular job. If you remember in the very beginning of Tanya, we gave a metaphor. 
of about a king that wanted to test out his son. So he hires a prostitute to test her out to see, will the son fall into the trap of doing a sin? He wants the woman to fail. She would like him to fail too because she's an employee. I mean, she's not maybe the highest caliber person, but she respects the king, and but she's getting paid for her job. So she'll do her job, but in the back of her mind, she'll be happy if, the, if she fails because then this kid will get in trouble. So at the end of the day, but all she is really is an employee. But there's something even more. Whenever Hashem creates these forces that are becoming God's employees to test the challenge, to give difficulty, to give concealment, God gives them the least possible amount of energy to exist. That means when he creates a Sefer Torah, when he creates a shul, when he creates even a cup of coffee, he gives a lot of energy. When he creates evil, sinful things, things that are uh, inappropriate or, or uh, bad or like a sudden, he gives it the least possible life, just enough. That means the forces that are higher to test out the child, the prince, is going to be given the smallest possible salary. And the second you're done, it's like, out of here. I don't want to see you ever again. Because I never, in the first place, was interested in you. I just use you as a way to, meaning, I don't even want to see you again. So Hashem gives us at least life force. Everything in the world that's klippa, but not klippa snega. We're talking about Shalash Klippa Zatmega, which has another a name. It's called Sitra Achra. Sitra Achra is the word we use for all the full-on klippas, the full darkness. It all has minimal, minimal life force to exist. All the heavy life force is in spirituality. What happens? If you're a low-income thief, where are you going to steal from? The rich neighborhood. So what do they attract themselves to? They try, how can I get life force from the holy places? Which means the holier you are, the more attractive you are to Klippa. Klippa's not interested in going to the poor neighborhoods and stealing. What am I going to get? You know, some nickels and dimes. I want to go to the bank. I want to go to the jewelry store. I want to go to the rich guy's house where I can steal a lot of stuff. In other words, these parasites, the Klippa's really a parasite. It lives, uh, leeches on other, other people. He tries to leech on. What's the greatest source of leeching? If they can get a Jew to do a sin. What happens when a Jew sins? Now you're drawing down tremendous, tremendous, because a Jew is getting from Panemius. No one, no one gets from Panemius besides a Jew. He says, if I get from Panemius, essence godliness, yes, it's going through the filter. And if I, now when a Jew does a sin, it's no longer living through Nega. He just crossed over into Shalash Klobaz Atmeas, Sitra Achra. He now is feeding Mr. Sitra Achra tremendous energy. Sitra Achra says, I like this program. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pay him well. I'm going to make sure whenever he sins, he's going to get an abundance of wealth. What does that mean? Imagine, for example, you inherit from somebody billions of dollars worth of diamonds. You have no idea what they're worth. You have no idea that each diamond you have is worth, let's say, a million dollars. And you have these crooks who find out about these diamonds. And they say, listen, we'll give you $10,000 for each diamond, which is a joke. But you, like, $10,000 are just little rocks. They're worth nothing. You know what? Yeah, take. So they're going to keep paying you $10,000. You're going to walk away thrilled. You have so much money. But meanwhile, they have millions. They're going to give you the skim off the top, but how much you're getting? Nothing compared to the real picture. That's what Sitra Achra does. Sitra Achra, the, the deep clipper, when it receives energy through a Jew who goes off the path, it takes 90% for itself and gives 10% back to the guy. 10% is huge. So the bigger you're sinning, the more you're sinning, the more these parasites are going to feed you to keep you on the line, keep you addicted to the sin. So it's actually the way it works spiritually. That when a person does a sin, these clip of parasites will suck from you all these pure panemius chayas that comes from Hashem, which they never can get. That comes from the Hei Tata, the second Hei of God's name. They could never get this spirituality. And they'll keep feeding you a lot of success, wealth, happiness, and whatever else could, could get you going. So you should keep in that path. And therefore, he says, someone who sins will get much more. Because when we do mitzvahs, all that stuff is held. We hold on to that stuff for later. We're not interested in just physical, material, temporary joy. The, the benefits are much longer term. But these guys say, you know what? Here, go buy some candy, cookies, you know, whatever will thrill the person. And meanwhile, they're completely getting stronger and stronger. But more than that, as we'll see, what does that mean? We're dragging down that holiness, that Sefer Torah, that godliness into the backyards, into the basements of Klippa. So we're doing something tremendously negative here in the process of not only getting our life force from the most impure place, but we're dragging godliness into the deepest, darkest exile. That means godliness is suffering. Godliness is going into this um, drudges or dredge of, uh, of, of uh, evil and impurity. With that information, let's see what he explains now. Let's go back inside. The <laughs> Not only will you get some life force, through Klippas Neiga, you will get much more life force. You will be the richest guy. Why? 
the yes, there's a is the yes, there is more in quantity and more in quality. quality. As that which is explained in the, in the book of Zehar, the Sefer Zehar, in the portion of Bikudai, Shakol Shefa Vechayas, Hanishpas La that all the life force and all the energy that a person down here, a human being, meaning a Jew, will uh, bring down and draw down at a time when he's doing evil in the eyes of God. And it's very interesting here. It says, whether it's evil of action, you're going now and eating a pork sandwich, or not a sandwich, plain pork too, or you're speaking inappropriate uh, things, you're talking Lashon Hara, or you're cheating, or you're lying, or you're making an orphan feel bad, or a widow feel bad, you're doing things that are considered serious verbal sins. Or contemplating, thinking, imagining, fantasizing about significant sins, also damages, and sometimes we claim Tanya, the fantasizing in thought is much worse because thought's much closer bound with the soul. That's why thought never stops. It's always alive where speech could stop, action could stop. But thought, a person's mind is constantly busy. V'chulu, that's what's after that. If you have thought, speech, and action, what's v'chulu? The Alter Rebbe explains v'chulu means thinking about inappropriate things that are not sinful. For an example, the thinking or picturing or watching um, the the men and women uh, in, uh, being intimate with each other. What happens there, it's not a sin, technically. A person that, if someone pictures about it, there's no, no sin. It's not like having an, uh, an affair. There's no sin. But the impurity that someone drags down when they have, not sinful thoughts. They're sin sinful, but they're not sins. They're inappropriate. Mm -hmm. Also draws down tremendous negative energy to the um, force of evil. All of that comes through the medium of klippa, but not just any klippa. No longer are we dealing with the coffee klippa, the Danish klippa, the cheese Danish klippa. Now we're dealing with evil pork, you know, all the way through klippa. It explains there that when someone does a sin, now you're no longer getting on the track from klippa snega. You just change tracks. Now you're getting all the sustenance through the path, the pipes, the medium, the vehicle of Shalash Klub Zatmeyus, which means you're becoming, first of all, a slave to that. You're becoming owned by it. That's why eventually the Alter explained to Tanya at some point it's very difficult even to repent because you become almost like an addict. What happens is in the beginning, a person has a choice of sin. Should I sin? Should I not? Yeah, I'm really tempted. I'll sin. After doing a sin often enough, you actually become controlled by them because it's almost like a drug. It's, not, it's really not much different where you want to get that high, you want to get that feeling. It comes only through Klippa. And that's a very, very tough thing to change. Now, he says something here so fascinating. Now, it seems like that during exile, wouldn't really have a choice anyway, because everything we're getting is either coming through Klippas Nega or Shalash Klippas Atmeyas. The Alter Rebbe says no. Even in exile, even after the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, even now that everything comes through Klippas Nega, you have a choice how you get your highest through Klippa or directly from God. How is that possible? And it's a fascinating idea he's going to tell you here. And he's telling you why, I mean, now that he told you that you're dragging things down, you might say, one second, I don't have a choice. He says, you do have a choice. And what the choice is, beautiful. He says, And you have a choice. If you want to get it from the negative evil places, or get it directly from the holy place. Where all the holiness comes from, you have a choice. Why do you have a choice? So in the early in, I think the chapter, I forgot where it was, chapter 7 or 8. I think it was 7, I forget what it was. When the Alter Rebbe explained the difference between Klippas Nega and Shalash Klippas Atmeis. Mm -hmm. Shalash Klippas Atmeis is absolutely 100% um, evil. No, even though, unless you do Tshuva, which we'll talk about at the very end of the <laughs> chapter. Klippas Nega is absolutely neutral before you interact with it, which means before I interact with uh, something in the world, there's three categories. There's holy, like a Sefer Torah. There's forbidden fruit. And then there's neutral. Once I interact, there's no more neutral. Either it was holy or unholy. There's no more, any single behavior in the world that we're going to do as Jews. The second we interact with it, that means the second I drink the, eat the cheese Danish, the second I take a walk, I go to the gym, it was either a holy experience or it was an unholy experience. It wasn't neutral. So for an example, going to that cheese Danish, Either I had a cheese day together with a friend and we had a very meaningful discussion about, you know, just life. So we both made each other more positive energy and we created a positive reality of two friends sitting and talking. Or we became a discussion where we sat and talked about either meaningless things or even worse, we spoke about things that are about other people. We we spoke Lush and her for half an hour, which sometimes is really 
do the juicy. So what happens is at that point, for sure, if you talk Lashon Hara, that Janish became unholy. But even if you talk meaningless stuff, meaningless stuff means you came on company time because we're here all on company time and we abuse one hour of our time. We have a job, come to this world to make it a holy place. And for one hour, we abuse that to use it for meaningless stuff. That, you, that was just a waste of uh, leaving the engine running on your car for an hour. Why are you parked? What are you doing? You're wasting. It's a, it's a selfish, meaningless, disrespecting the supplier. Yeah. But even if you just make a bracha on this guy. Oh, the yeah. Place. Making a bracha could be itself. Yeah. So if someone made a very good example, by that case also, if you made a bracha, that might be enough too. The fact you made a bracha and you sat down and didn't talk about her might also be ready to elevate it. Yeah. 100%. Good example. Good point. Very good point. <laughs> Important point. Now, that being said, when I go now and interact with something, I have a choice. Even though it's Klippas Nega and it's going through the filter of Nega, I still have a choice. What's the experience going to be? Is it going to be elevated to holiness and therefore automatically everything's channeled? And I'll explain in a minute how it changes over. Everything's channeled through holiness or it gets changed over to Shalash Klippas Meis and it's channeled through impurity. Now, how could somebody go and change it? I mean, if we said that it was coming through um, the concealment, the shell, remember, what's a, a translucent shell? It's like a garment, it's like clothes. We call it a lavush, a garment, something that holds the light. So it's important to know that there are two types of clothes or garments in the world. And a garment doesn't necessarily mean this clothes that we wear. I'll explain different types in a second. Mm -hmm. One type of garment is a garment that conceals. It hides. It's job to cover up. Another type of garment is a garment to reveal. For an example, no one knows right now that I'm really a pilot for an airplane. But if I put on my uniform, hey, I just revealed who I am. Because that looks as poor, of course. Or no one knows, for an example, that I'm a police officer. Or no one knows that I'm a chef. When you put on certain garments, you tell someone. Or the same thing could be to show someone's beauty. There are things you can wear to hide. Some other guy is a policeman, and he hides himself with his garments. You don't know who I am. I'm dressed like you should never know who I am. So those there are garments that can reveal and garments that conceal. We get to determine if the garment of Klippas Nagel will reveal the truth that inside is godliness or conceal the truth that inside is godliness. We make that choice when we go and act with the neutral for good or for bad. Now, let's take another two examples of things that could be either to conceal or to, to a garment. One of the most famous garments used is a garment called a metaphor. What's a metaphor? I want to explain something complicated. And I can't think of a way to explain it to somebody who doesn't know this field. So I say, you know what, let me give you an example. Well, the example is not about this anymore. I'm talking about now a king walking in the field. <laughs> I thought you were talking about God and Rosh Hashanah and Elo. Well, let me tell you about a king in the field, how it works. And then what I'm really trying to do is using a metaphor, which is a garment which conceals, but I'm using it to reveal to tell you more about God. When I use a metaphor, I'm actually sharing more about the subject, even though I'm using some other terms, so I'm concealing it. So it's a garment that reveals more about the person or about the subject. Another example of a garment would be speech. Speech is a garment. By definition, speech conceals, mm -hmm. like we said many times, much of my feelings. I will never be able to share my feelings in speech. At the same time, without speech, you'll never know what I'm thinking. You might see I look sad or I look happy. You will know for what? Did I miss my bus? Did uh, Brett, Aaron, Aaron Rogers break his ankle? You know, what happened? Mm -hmm. Why are you you're looking sad today? Maybe someone's happy for that. I don't know. So you'll know only by my speaking. So speaking while it's a concealment, it's the daim, it's the lowest level of a person's uh, interaction and interface with the world nevertheless it is the revealing now that i spoke with this garment called speech now you know what i'm thinking now you know what i was feeling now you know what i want to do or what i uh, want to ask you etc so based on that information now we can go back and when something comes to clip us nega it's a garment whether it will be a garment that reveals the truth that it all comes from god whether it's a garment that conceals the truth that it all that, that it comes from god that's the truth and you're concealing it that is determined by how we use that thing. When I go and use that cheese dish, or I go to the gym and exercise for an hour, and my intention is to be in better energy and better health, that I can be a much more functioning parent or a wife or a husband or, or a friend or a sugar or whatever, I should have more energy. Suddenly, I'm not standing in the gym as a place of self, you know, I'm not going there just to, you know, be some super, you know, beautiful, handsome person. I'm going there because I want to have more energy. Suddenly, the whole gym experience becomes holy. I lifted it up and it's no longer about, it's no longer um, concealment of God. I reveal the truth that the gym was never put there for just, um, you know, the Greeks and the Romans to look, you know, with their physique. It was put there for a Jew to go, or anybody for that matter, to go and use it for good to become a stronger, healthier, functioning Jew. So now we can understand the concept. Let's see it inside here. So, a person is an absolute free person to choose whether he receives 
the um, Hashpa, which comes from Panemius originally, through the chambers of Sitra Achra, which means the three uh, levels of Klippa, which are evil. All you're going to receive it directly from the source of holiness. You could, even though we're in exile, even though it's after the temple was destroyed, even though it all comes from Klippa's Lega, we could choose how it's going to function, how it's going to be. We know when Hashem created the thing, He made uh, equal, everything has an equal match, everything has an equal part. That means Everything is a mix of good and evil. Everything could be used, in, unless, it's, unless it's in the first place, just evil. Everything could be used either for good or for evil. Fire can cook and fire can burn. Nuclear power, as Rebbe spoke, can power a city or destroy a city, God forbid. Now, now we're going to go explain what I said afterwards about the whole nature of the klippa to be a parasite. The <laughs> And what happens is, as we said before, when we allow the klippa, the shalosh klippas the sidracha, to draw down using klippa snega, using this thing that instead of going for revealing the truth, concealing it, it actually leads them into the world of shalosh klippas atmeis, and they could, so to speak, um, uh, sustain themselves or um, suckle off, you know, they, parasite off the holy, sweet, beautiful energy and use it for um, evil. They basically become stronger. Now the Alter Rebbe is going to go and take a line, and he's starting with the words, um, mm. it sounds like he's saying a new idea, even though he's saying an idea we learned before, because he's telling us a new perspective of the idea. Last time we spoke about Yaakov Chav Nachlasai, the whole the idea of Yaakov, the Jewish people being the rope is our inheritance, and we have a rope connection that sustains us. The whole point was us, how we could block or receive or get nourishment and sustenance from God. We said it's like a long rope from us to God, and we get our sustenance, like electric wires or, or hoses or whatever it is, feeding us energy, and we could block it or not block it. That was the point last time. Now we're talking about something else. Uh, we had this, um, I think in the Chumash yesterday, a beautiful idea. We had it somewhere else just yesterday, a beautiful idea the other way around, or a mimer, I just saw it. Um, uh, I'll before I say what he says here, and I'll tell you what I saw in the mimer, whoever I was reading, I don't know. Um, here he's saying, that just in the other extreme, we talked until now. We talked about how a person's sustenance received because we have one long rope connecting us to our source. Now he's telling us that source connected to God. If you yank that rope, you're yanking God. That means your actions. It, it comes with a you know. There's a famous concept. The Rebbe told many shluchim, "I go with you." So on one hand, it's a phenomenal thing. You have the Rebbe's strength wherever you go. On the other hand, he, I go with you. You go to a place that isn't good. You're stopping me with you. I'm going with you, you know. There's a there's a story told about Rabbi um what's his last name? Oh darn it. Lipsker. Rabbi Lipsker from uh, New Jersey. I heard the story, I heard part of it from him, part from someone else. He says that when he was a young man in the 50s, so then it wasn't like today going to a ball game or a sports game is more much more accepted. There used to be mm-hmm. things that in the 50s and 60s were like not so accepted for religious people to do. It was like not a place. One thing was going to a ball game was like a big deal to go. So we asked the Rebbe, there's a guy from our shul that wants to go to a ball game, should I go with him? The Rebbe said, whether you go to the ball game or not, you should decide yourself. But just know that wherever you go, you take me with. <laughs> do what you, in other words, whatever you're doing, you're schlepping the holiness with you. So a person should know when you do a sin, we're schlepping down God with us. So the Rebbe once told somebody who said to the Rebbe, Rebbe, I don't care about punishment and exile and this. I don't care. I don't, I don't want Mashiach. Oh, oh, he said the Rebbe, sorry. He said the Rebbe, I don't want Mashiach. I'm not interested in Mashiach. I'm happy the way the world is right now. I just, the way it's good is good for me. I don't need Mashiach. So the Rebbe said, I understand for you, you don't want Mashiach, but have some kindness for God. You know, God's in exile. As long as we're here, he slept into the whole story. Have some Rahmanas on God. Just for yourself, maybe you don't care, but care for God that he's being schlepped into the, to the mess. That's what he says here. But Yaakov, Chevel Nachlos, Iksiv, it says Yaakov is the, the, his rope, is his portion. Just like a rope. That one end of the rope is all the way above by God. And the second head is down here. If someone shakes or pulls this end, the other end comes with it. You can't pull this end and not slip that side automatically. You give a pull, that side comes too. Obviously, only as much as you can pull the rope. You can't pull the rope more than it can be pulled. But whatever you do down here, it's one long rope. Whatever you do affects above. He says, It's the same thing as exactly. Is. 
the source of the Shama of a Jew. In its source, we said the second hey of God's name, who mamshech, who made it hashpa'asa, adem maisav herdoyim, machshav esav. You're drawing down and you're schlepping its energy into your evil acts, whatever they may be. All the way into the chambers, as if it were. You're basically dragging godliness down into the shmutz. Because at the time when you do a sin and you're thinking evil thoughts or saying evil things, where do you think you get energy right now from? God doesn't get energy for this. That means you're having it come through the conduit, the path, the chambers, the medium, the vehicle of impurity. That means you're schlepping God through the pipes of the impurity. Because the only way to speak evil is to harness evil. You can't speak evil or talk evil or do evil with holiness. It doesn't work. So you got to tap into the evil energy. That means you're schlepping godliness into the evil energy. Because there's no other like source. It's not like there's another supplier of energy. All comes from God. And if you're schlepping it down and energy is coming through evil, <laughs> then you slap godliness there. And because you're giving them so much hashpa, therefore they give you a tip. They give you a, off the skill off the top. They say, you know what? Thank you for supplying us with diamonds. You don't know they're worth millions. Here, we'll give you $10,000 each diamond. It's a joke, but they're giving it to you because it's like a way of saying, keep supplying us. So that's what it means. That's why, you get, that's why things seem to be go so, you know, so swell for you. Now the Rebbe answers a very fascinating question. If that's the if that's the case, why aren't we all rocking and rolling in good news? We're in exile. Many not, not in this room, but many other people do sins. We should all be having so much money, so much good stuff. Life should be good, no health problems. We should be having so much evil energy that they keep tipping us and giving us so much money and so much off the top. Why does any Jew have a problem? Why is so much exile? Why so much suffering? Why so much? Why so much pain in exile? And that's what he says. Together with this came the gullus. That means it wasn't just the gullus; it was the churban. It was destruction. In other words, what happened in the process was true that the wicked um, do prosper, but unfortunately, you're in gullus and you're not to get in meaning. When there's a lot of wicked people, not all the wicked prosper. There's some wicked people that are having a bad time. They're suffering. They're sitting in jail. In other words, yes, the wicked prosper and sins usually uh, could pay off. But unfortunately, you're not getting paid off. The other guys are. In other words, we're in exile. Don't forget that we're not just having ability to channel good into the past in the hands of evil, but also in a darkness and not necessarily are we going to be okay uh, just because it's possible to be okay. Just because most doctors earn you know, this much money doesn't mean you'll make that much money. It's a uh, gullus. It doesn't work so simple. And this is what it says. We don't have in our hands. See the Gemara and Mishnah explains it differently. Uh, Mishnah explains it literally. We don't understand. We don't have in our hands to understand why wicked have peace and tranquility and why righteous people suffer. The Alter Rebbe says, We don't have it in our hands. Not like, we don't have it. Meaning, just because it's a possibility in exile to get it, it doesn't mean we're going to get it. So don't think a person might say, you know what? I want a good life. I'll sin. And I'll be rocking. Be, you know, all go swell. That's so simple. It's gullus. Doesn't go. It's not magic either way. It's not magic in the olden days that the that the that the righteous people got physical rewards. It's not magic that the sin the sinners are going to get the big money. Gullus. What does it mean? They knew it now in our hands after the gullus after the churban because doesn't work the same. And this is what it means that the shechina isn't gallus. And today, living in the world we live in today, God's actual shechina is in exile. We had it in the parsha this past week, or I think this week even, uh, that it says that God's shechina is in gallus. Mm-hmm. But when a person does tshuva, to the fact that Hashem has to provide and give to his enemy. One of the worst things, God forbid, is when someone has somebody that's fighting against his family. You know, someone, and then you're giving them millions of dollars to the, to the terrorism or this, it hurts. And especially if you have to be the one to give it. Imagine they tell you, you have to pay the terrorists who destroyed your neighborhood, destroyed your family. What? That's the worst exile to do. I'm paying, I'm giving money to those who want to destroy me. That's what Hashem is doing. Hashem is giving energy and life force through our behavior to those that want to destroy godliness, those who hate God. But oh, the said, this is such a beautiful way to finish off Rosh Hashanah. When a person does proper repentance, then it's taken away from them. We say, I'm sorry, sir, we're confiscating all these assets. What happened? The guy did shuva. He just lost everything. The guy who was giving you all these diamonds, give him back. What happens to shuva? 
by tshuva, you're almost like, I don't know if the metaphor you can say is like it's being sucked back like in a vacuum, but all the energy that was given over to the klippa is immediately taken away from them. My regret, if I have sincere regret, why did I go and do this sin? You just lost the, the powers of evil lost that energy because I no longer am living in that standard. And therefore, I'm no, the only reason you have it is because I drew down, I schlepped that to you. That's why you're tipping me. That's why you're giving me the bonus. But now that I regret it, I'm no longer giving it to you. And therefore, it all gets removed from them. And you're basically taking the Shekhinah out of exile. And this is what it means. What's the word Teshuvah mean? Tashuv hey. What's the Teshuvah? Hey, Tata, the second hey. That's where we get our Ashba from. Tashuv hey, we turn the hey. We turn the energy to the hey. But Bechina is Golos from its state of Golos. Which is because of Shav Vayalekecha, as Shavuzcha, like it says in our parasha this past week, Hashem will return the exiles. And the word he uses is Vishav. It doesn't say Vaheshav. Vaheshav means I will take and return. Vishav is like I will go with you. It says God is actually with us in exile. And when we go out of exile, Hashem goes out with us. It means Hashem will go out with your captives. Like it says in the Rashi, quoted from the Gemara, that it doesn't say Hashem will take out, like redeem us. It means Hashem will take us along with us and take us out of exile. So the message, the final conclusion of this parsha, this chapter is that yes, we unfortunately have the ability to drag down, by making our choices, to drag down the, the Kedusha, the holiness, the sanctity of this primiest, the highest, the essence of life from Heitata, the second day of God's name, into the most dirty and the, and the, the, the crowded places. But the moment we did shuva, sincerely, we undo all the negativity. If only that worked the same way with gaining weight, that the minute we regretted all that weight we gained, boop, it's gone. <laughs> but it uh, doesn't work so simple. Just to go back and explain uh, one more point that I saw about the rope. The rope has a third thing. So you mentioned two things so far. One thing about the rope was that uh, you have this source of energy coming to you and you can block it or not. The second point we made today was that the rope is connected to God by schlepping it downward. We're schlepping God downward. Because connected to God. The third point is that like God wants to schlep us up. He just does a little tug on top, and Hashem could awaken us. Sometimes we feel, why am I so inspired today? Why did I feel today? I want to go daven, I want to go learn. Hashem gave a little tug on the rope. And a lot of times Hashem will give, that's what we have in this month of Elul and Rosh Hashanah, that Hashem also gives a little tug on the rope. That's the mimer I was learning this morning and yesterday, that uh, a little tug on the rope by Hashem, since it's all one rope, could suddenly, hey, one second. You can get schlepped out of the quicksand, out of the mud, out of the, out of the whole situation, because it's all connected. So there are many benefits or thoughts to consider about this rope that binds us to God. Mm -hmm. I want you to have a healthy, happy, sweet new year. We'll start chapter seven, probably after the holidays. I, if we have, I, if I work out a class, we'll make one. But there's a good chance that we'll continue after Sukkot. We'll see. Um, I can think of one more class we could squeeze in before Yom Kippur, but we'll see. All right. Thank you, Rabbi Moshe. You're welcome. <laughs> So you said that um, Hashem gives very minimum to the evil sorcerer. Yeah, naturally. So doesn't like that. No, we give the rest. Mm -hmm. What happens is we give the rest. Hashem gave them the tiniest bit. We, through our interaction with them, there's a talk of the Rebbe, phenomenal, where he explains that he's talking about the UN, it seems like, over there. He's saying the more you give attention, credibility, and uh, deference to evil, the stronger it gets. Mm -hmm. And I think with the UN that you make it such an important thing that it becomes important. It really is nothing. Meaning you're creating it to be a power that should affect Israel. Don't give it the importance. The, but the the uh, one of the sikhs, I don't know if we did it on Shabbos morning. I think we did. Shabbos morning sikha we did was why is water so unique that water is that which transfers impurity? We know when you have laws of purity and impurity, um, if a fruit gets wet, it could transfer impurity. If it doesn't, it can't transfer it. In general, liquids can become impure, the easiest thing, left uncovered overnight. Wine, if you do this, or milk, if you don't watch it. The liquids can get tummy so quickly. And the reason is, the, the more something has holiness, the more it's attracted to impurity. And therefore, water is the nutrient of life, spiritually, and physically, it's a kosher as a person to go to mikvah, you could do elevate you. Water is life, and also physically, water is, uh, is life. That means water has the highest level of kadusha and, and vitality in it. Where is Clipper running to? Water. And therefore, it's constantly attracted to water. And therefore, it's, by the way, he says, holy people. And it's fascinating in halacha, it might get people offended. Gentiles have very little laws of impurity. We never worry about it, they don't get impure too easy. Very only uh, only rabbinically certain cases. In general, a dead body of a of a Jew 
has tremendous impurity, the dead battle of a Gentile, eh, not so much. Why? There's no attraction. Who's going to jump onto that? No, what are they going to get there? The Jewish body has a soul, which is there. And again, it's nothing offensive. It's just a concept. <laughs> that being said, he says, the more something is spiritual, the more it attracts the impurity forces and gets stronger and bigger. So the Rebbe says, in the next, no, it's not, he said, it's not fear. It seems like the more pious, the more religious you are, the bigger attraction you are. It's not fear to the person. You, you say, basically, the more mitzvahs I'm going to do, the more I'm going to be risking myself. And he says, yeah, but there's one catch. There's one exception when you can never become impure. He's talking there about fruit. He said, when the fruit is still attached to the tree, no tummy, you could touch it with a dead body. You could do whatever you want to it. It will never, a dead body is called Aviyah Vaisa Tumma, the grand grandfather of uh, Tumma. You can't make it a, a tummy. He says, as long as you connect it to a tzaddik, you connect it to your source, connect it to the Torah, you can't become impure. So yes, it's a, it's a bigger risk. The more attractive, it's like wearing jewelry in the street. Yeah, the more jewelry you wear, the more you're going to attract a thief. But it happened to you on the train once in the, with Avram. It's all it took her necklace away. <laughs> but um, the bottom line is, the more you wear jewelry, but the truth is, if you have the right protection, not to worry about. If you have the certain protection. And therefore, uh, yes, yeah, so in the world today, Klippa is tremendously fat, tremendously satiated, but it comes from years and years of exile where they're whatever. I think we should we should make a quick general regret for everybody and they'll go away. Hope. It's the day the sun has to be Yeah. <laughs> it is upsetting that Hashem created evil because we all uh, have a hard time because of it. That's that famous thing. I spoke about it at Shabbos by the kids a few weeks ago. I know there was a discussion afterwards. The Rebbe talks about how it's going to be the two opposites. He says, when Mashiach comes, we're going to say thank you, but we're not going to deny the suffering. He's going to say, we're going to say thank you, Hashem, for all the suffering, but we're not going to say thank you, Hashem, it wasn't suffering. That means all the challenges of Klippa in the world are challenges, are painful. Are, it doesn't mean they're bad. It means it hurts. It means it can be sad. It can be hurtful. It can be difficult. It can be challenging. It could be unpleasant. But at the end of the day, it's for a good purpose. Not that we want to justify it. God forbid. It's not our place. The Rebbe says, don't defend God. But the bottom line is, there, the fact that all these painful things are here, it is painful. The fact that evil seems to, unfortunately, you see sometimes so unfair how evil seems to win, both in the global scene and the private scene. And the, but that's exile. It's, uh, it's unfortunate. I have a funny question for everybody. Does anybody want some bananas? Oh, yeah. Did it happen again? Okay. Well, today I got another authorization to bring my 